Good morning, church. So now I used to, um, can everyone hear me all right? It's good. I used to listen to a lot of, um, I've heard, heard the music, drum and bass music. I can't stand it now. But um, as they were, there's a thing called, D, you know when the DJs mix, they you used to have the two decks, you know, the records, I don't know how you do it, but you, you blend in one tune from another. And in between, um, one of the MCs used to go, get ready for the next one coming in, get ready for the next one coming in. And, like, and it's a bit like, what this is, John the Baptist, as we'll see, who's Jesus' cousin, um, actually this, the, the prophecy that Fumi read really well, um, was from Isaiah saying, um, there's going to be someone saying, um, get ready for the next one coming in. In other words, prepare the way for the one coming behind me. God's coming to do something amazing. And as we're thinking about um, Christmas time like, um, and God... God's glory being revealed. It's all centred around Jesus. This prophecy of Isaiah is fully fulfilled in um, John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. And that's what John the Baptist come to do. To say, get ready for the next one coming in. Jesus is coming to do something amazing. And it's a word of great, uh, great encouragement and great comfort, especially in this time. Um, well, yeah, so especially as we're thinking about um, Christmas time. So... Uh, let's go into it anyway. But w the reading was Isaiah 40. Oh, the card that Mary gave me. <laughs> it Mary, isn't it? Yeah. Let's, get let's get it out. I ain't got much room up here because I've got a big, I've got my son's like book that I use to scribble in a bit. Um, yeah, so it started at verse 3. But if I read it from verse 1, it says this. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1, 1 to 5. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Funny, isn't it? And at that time, um, that's like a prophecy, Isaiah saying... That the, the children of Israel were going through a terrible time. They were in, in, in slave, were going to be in slavery um, in, uh, to the Babylonians. And yet in that moment, Isaiah, well God really speaking through Isaiah says, there's going to come a time, your hard service is done and your sin is paid for. So they must have understood that in the immediate context that our slavery under the yoke of the Babylonians is going to be over soon. But how much more of a fulfilment is it in Christ? Sins paid for, hard service done. This is an amazing, incredible passage um, that we're going to go into. So as, as we think about it, it's like I said, John the Baptist, get ready. Be prepared. God's coming to do something amazing. Hard service over, sins paid for. There's no one too low, no one too downtrodden, no one too bad or down in the dumps to be redeemed and be part of God's family. There's no, the mountains are going to be brought low. There's no, there's no barriers that are going to block us coming from God. There's no hard striving, trying, think, oh, thinking, oh, have I done enough to earn God's favour? That's going to be dealt with as well. You know that song, the, the higher you build your barriers, the taller, right? You know that one. A bit like that with God, when we try to shut him out. He's, he's so big and amazing. Anyway, uh, and those that are trapped on a path to destruction, you can have a reason and an empowerment from the Holy Spirit to go on a straight, level, plain path. You can know where you're going. Anyway, let's, as we get into it, how do we know that this prophecy, this was written probably, I'm guessing, if it's probably about 650 to 700 years before Jesus was born. So... Um, and it reaches this fulfilment in Christ. But how do we know that John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, um, how do we know this all reaches fulfilment in John the Baptist and Jesus? Um, so if you can put up for me uh, John chapter 1, um, verses 19 to 34. It's a little bit of a long reading, but 
we need to go for it because otherwise the whole talk's not really going to make any sense if we don't. So, starting at 1, um, 19 to 34. And this is John the Baptist, um, who's Jesus' cousin, being questioned by the religious authorities about who he is because he was doing amazing stuff. He was a very bold, robust preacher who really told it how it was. And he was drawing a lot of attention, saying, you know, you've got the one coming behind me, you've got to get ready for him. Anyway, now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He didn't fail to confess, but confess freely. I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He answered, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet. This is the prophecy we just had read. Uh, I am the one. I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptise if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptise with water, John replied, but among you stands one you don't know. He is the one who comes after me. The thongs of sand, or like the thong, probably like the laces or something like that. Have you? The thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptising. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him. Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself didn't know him, but the reason I come baptising with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except the one who sent me to baptise with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit rest and remain on, come down and remain on, is he who will baptise with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. It's amazing. So we see there in in Isaiah, in, in the... Chapter 40, verses 1 and 2, it says hard service and sins are going to be paid for. You can take comfort in that. And John definitely sees that this is Jesus who's going to be the one to fulfil that. Because he says, look, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Um, he de- yeah, so... And he, he quotes as well, and he says, like, I, they, they said, who are you, John? And he said, I'm the one, I'm, I'm the one who's prophesied. In Isaiah, the voice of one calling in the desert, get ready and prepare the way for the Lord. Also, John gave a testimony saying that right at the end, I testify that this is um, the Son of God. This is our, so he's not only the Son of God, but if you read Isaiah, it says make a way, um, make a way, a highway. Right, let me read it. Um, uh, verse 3, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. So Jesus is not just the Son of God, he's our God, God the Son as well. That's why we get the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Anyway, let's go into uh, some of the New Testament bits concerning around um, what happened with John the Baptist. How did John the Baptist know who Jesus was? Um, but before we do that, what I love about it, it says, a voice of one calling in the desert. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. This ain't John the Baptist just thinking, oh, I know, I'm going to get up and bring encouragement to God's people. This is actually God inspiring John to get up and encourage people. Like These are the words of God saying you can take courage and encourage uh, uh, encouragement and comfort and and it's in a desert when you think of a desert what goes on in a desert pretty much nothing it, there's you can't really grow much in there it's all dead isn't it there's nothing going on and i wonder and yet it's it kind of you have an imagery of there's nothing going on complete and utter deadness then god just shows up and does something amazing i wonder what situation that you find yourself in or 
maybe listening at home online. Maybe you think this, these Christians seem mad. They're so happy all the time. They're singing about this Jesus guy, but my life is completely dead. You don't know what's going on in my life. I'm struggling so much, this can't be for me. Actually, if you're in a place of complete deadness, you're in the right place. Because God can speak and bring life into, what, into your life today. And not only that, sometimes deadness, can you might have it all together. Or on the surface of things, you might have it all together. We was over at the, ser uh, the service in the park last night and I was saying, many people can have lots of cars, money, they can have all the girls around them and they appear on the surface to have everything they need. But actually there's a deadness inside, a dryness inside, where people think there must be more to life than this. And it's all a bit of a show. Actually, that's maybe you today. God wants to speak life um, in, into, your, into your deadness, in, as he did into my deadness. And um, if you think that Christianity is boring, speak to anyone in here afterwards. It's the best thing ever. It's the most fullness of life. It's brilliant. It's pretty beautiful. Anyway, but, uh, let's get into it. Yeah, John didn't, John didn't just decide, um, he didn't just read the Bible in Isaiah, because he probably would have had access to it, well he would have, because he quoted it. John didn't just say, oh, you know what, I want to be the one who the prophecy is about. I, I want to be the one um, who God, who, the voice in the desert, that's going to be me. And he didn't just say, oh, but we've got a part to fill. Um, I've got to make the way for God. So who can we put into that role? I know, my cousin Jesus. It doesn't work like that. He didn't just decide, oh, this is, I'll have this prophecy for me, thank you. But what we see amazingly is the Holy Spirit had his hand on John's life all the way from even before. Well, what's that saying? It's when he was a twinkle in his dad's eye. The Holy Spirit had his hand on, on John's life. And this is the amazing thing. Christianity is not just come and study a book as a matter of history for the sake of it. You can know the God who wrote it. And God speaks to each and every person and, and, and comforts, us, comforts us supernaturally in an amazing way. We can have a relationship and an encounter with the God of the Bible. Anyway, let's see what happened to John the Baptist, where it all started. So if you read, um, I, won't, I won't go through all of these. Um, in, in Luke, you can look these yourself if you want. But in Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 25, when John was a twinkle in his dad's eye, um, there's a man called Zachariah who was a priest. And his wife was too old to have kids. And then an angel comes up to him and says, your wife's going to have a kid. And he's like... I can't, that's not going to happen. And it, it basically, the, the, the prophecy is saying that um, you're, you're going to have a, a kid and he's going to turn many people back to God. But Zachariah is like, I can't, she's too old. And what was funny actually, um, the angel Gabriel said, because you've not believed, you're not going to be able to speak now until the baby's born. I love that. No negativity, shut it. He's put his hand over his mouth. I love that. And it makes you think, doesn't it? We need to be careful what we say. We can, we can be really positive with our tongues, can't we? James warns about it in the scriptures, doesn't he? Like we praise God uh, and, and then we, we curse men who are made in his image. Like this is something to really think about. But anyway, Zachariah, he couldn't speak. He couldn't speak until John the Baptist was born. So anyway, yeah, so, or, so it's kind of a miracle anyway, like um, the, the, the Holy Spirit had his hand on John's life from like a twinkle in his dad's eye. Um, not only that, in Luke chapter 1 verse 41, for, for all of those in here who have had, um, had babies, you know when women, you know, when you're pregnant, sometimes you see the belly, like the baby kicking around and stuff like that. Does he know what, yeah. Anyway, so you've got baby Jesus was in the belly of Mary, and you've got John the Baptist in the belly of his mum, Elizabeth. 
And as Mary meets Elizabeth, the Bible says that John the Baptist inside the belly leapt in the womb. Something was going on there. Like in other words, at the age of, I don't know, minus, I don't know how, how, how young he was, maybe, I don't know, he was not even born anyway, he's in the womb. And he's like, soon as he hears, you know, he's like, I can't see nothing, but that's my Lord and Saviour, yes. Like, he's giving it some in the belly. Like, how funny is that? Um, you can see even, even from that, even in the womb. And, and it, makes, it makes me, when I, especially when you've got hot topic debates about abortion and stuff like that, really close to the heart, it really makes you value life even in the womb. It's amazing. Um, yeah. But anyway, and not only that, so if I read, yeah, uh, let's go to, so you see how John, John uh, the Holy Spirit has had his hand on John from the very beginning, right? But then if you read 1 John, 32, uh, 1 John chapter 32, it says, Then John gave this testimony, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, Jesus. I would not have known him except the one who sent me to baptise with water. The man, who see you, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptise with the Holy Spirit. I've seen and testify that this is the Son of God. John says, I didn't know Jesus was the Messiah except that God had told him, like the one who the Holy Spirit comes on. That's, that's the one you're going to see. That's the one that, that's how you know. John the Baptist must have known, like... There must have been an inclination that, oh yeah, your cousin is the Messiah. But what he's probably meaning when he says, I didn't know except that the Holy Spirit, that God told me, is like, he could have meant, yeah, other people have told me, but per- my, personally from God, I don't, I don't know this. But yet God told John, the Holy Spirit will come down and rest on Jesus. And, and that's how you will know. So what, what I love about this though, and, and like I've said already, is that's what Christianity is. It's an encounter with God. It's not just believe the Bible. It's, you can have a relationship with the author of the Bible. It's amazing. So, so we know that Jesus is John saying, get ready for the next one coming in. God's coming to do something amazing. And as a result of Jesus' coming, what is going to happen? What is going to happen? So you've got... Verse 3, um, a voice of one calling in the desert, make way for the Lord. Ma- thank you. Make sure. Actually, start with verse 4. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. But if we stick to the first bit, every valley raised up. Every valley is going to raised up. And, and to me, that seemingly looks like people that put themselves far down. You've done too much bad stuff to ever be part of God's family. And as you know, I've said many, many times, um, uh, we've seen the grace of God on people, especially in this area in my own life, people that are so far away from God, how he's had mercy on them. And in 1 Timothy 1, um, 15 to 16, in a nutshell, St. Paul, he says he's the worst sinner but God had grace and mercy on him so that through him God might display his patience and everyone would look at him and be like, wow, what a sinner. How patient is God um, to have mercy on this man? And it would cause people that put themselves like, I'm way far out of God's reach, actually, by what Jesus has done by dying on the cross, paying for the sins of humanity, people, the valleys, those right down far away from God can be raised up and become part of God's family. It's not just that though. I I see a lot of people that have done really bad stuff, have been forgiven, be part of God's family, but they might look around and say, well, I do want to do more for God. I want to get right stuck into the kingdom, but my past is kind of, I'm all right being here, thanks. I'm all right. It's just enough for me to be a child of God and 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 stay here. But actually, even in God is encouraging you to go forward even more. We're ambassadors and soldiers for Christ. There's there's so much work to do. There's a, a world that is falling away from God at such a speedy rate. 
They need the gospel of Christ so desperately. And he's calling each and every person. So there, there might be even Christians today. You're saved, yeah. You come in, you're comfortable here. But actually God wants to raise you further up to a, another calling. What else is God calling you to do to be his representative in this dying world? Um, and I'll give people the opportunity to respond to that later. Um, Jesus often asked people as well. He, he often asked people that were, were really sick actually. They, like a lot of disabilities, some of them. And it, he, he said to them, do you want to get well? And someone brought this up in a Bible study the other week. And he said, I wonder why he asked that question. Because sometimes getting well means that we lose the comfort of the benefit around us. And um, so, yeah, and, and, he, and I think that's actually a good valid point. Sometimes staying in our position of deadness or staying in our position of comfort, we can get, there's quite some benefits to it. But actually Jesus wants to raise us further and, and to go and be all that he's called us to be in Christ. So that's how he ministers. How else can God raise you up uh, if you're in, in a valley of discomfort? Um, if you're sick, sometimes God can heal you. I know um, Roger Dyson had a real big cancer scare. Um, he prayed, went to the doctors, got healed of that. Which was, it was amazing, absolutely amazing. But what about when you pray and he doesn't answer it? What about, how does God help you if you're in the valley of suffering grief from unanswered prayer? What happens then? And we've seen it in this church time and time again. We've prayed so much for loved ones who are dying and God didn't answer the prayer in the way that we hoped he would and they passed away. Wow, how does God help? How does God raise that valley up? How can we find comfort? What is Jesus going to do to bring hope and comfort in that time? Because at times, Jesus seemingly looks like he doesn't know what he's doing. But when you look at everything he does, uh, everything he's done in his fullness, he does know what he's doing. Anyway, we'll go through some of this. Anyway, what happens with unanswered prayer when you pray for loved ones and they're sick? And they don't get healed. How's he going to bring comfort there? Is there something wrong? Are we doing something wrong? Why is he not answering? Anyway, I just want to read with you really, really quickly. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 20. And it's Paul. You know, you know St. Paul is like a proper man of God. If there was someone sick in this church, you can bet your bottom dollar he'd be praying for their supernatural healing. He definitely didn't think that the gifts of the Holy Spirit had ceased. He was a, you know, proper. But listen to this. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20, he says, I let, this is a bit of a name, so you'll have to bear with me on this. Trophemus, that's it. I left Troce, Trophemus sick in Miletus. So in other words, there's a guy that Paul, who has seen and done amazing miracles for God. He's got this guy who's sick and he wants him to be healed. And he's like, please God heal him. I want him to come on this mission with me. And he doesn't. Doesn't heal him. And Paul's like, I don't know what to do. I better leave him here sick. He can't come with us. But Paul didn't lose his encouragement. Paul was fully encouraged because Paul knows that Jesus often looks like he doesn't know what he's doing, but he absolutely does. And how does Paul know that? Well, for a starters, Jesus died on the cross himself. How much more can you look like you've lost the plot and you don't know what you're doing if you're going through death yourself? Number one, but Jesus was like so misunderstood in so many ways. In, in John 11, I haven't got time to read it. Lazarus is a man who's dying. People come up to him. Jesus, Lazarus is going to die. You've got to go and sort him out. You don't get there now, he's going to die. Jesus stays where he was another two days. Like, what is that about? And then Lazarus dies. And then they show up, he shows up and they're like, Jesus, if you would have been here. Like, it makes no sense until Jesus shows up four days late. Lazarus has already been dead four days. What on earth are you doing, Jesus? 
But what was amazing, there was a Jewish myth that a lot of Jews believed, not necessarily they could get this from the Bible, but there was a Jewish myth that they believed that after three days, the soul had left the body. So that, that's it, there's no chance of resurrection whatsoever. And this is four days late. You can imagine the Jews laughing in their mind. <laughs> This man thinks he's the Messiah. He doesn't even know the basic understanding that the soul's gone. What a wally, he's turned up the day late. Jesus turned up there on purpose to say, please don't put me in a box. I'm the Lord of time. I know exactly what I'm doing. Don't tell me I'm off or on time. And we do look at life like that. We think, God, answer it here and now because it's going to affect that. And if we've lost loved ones here... God's like, no worries, when you go there, I'll just move them over there to a place called heaven. And we can take so much comfort in that. What about Luke twenty-two thirty-six? Remember the disciples were practically foaming at the mouth. Ugh! Remember this whole prophecy um, is, is spoken to Israel in a time when they're in bondage in Babylon. And he says, comfort, comfort, your time of hard service is over. That's the prophecy, right? And, and in, in Jesus' time, they're in slavery again. The Romans are in control. So they're looking comfort. The hard service is over. John the Baptist is here. Yes, it's going to go. We're going to bust them up. And especially like Jesus preached the lovey-dovey message, where he needed to be blunt and bold, he was. He didn't mince his words. Definitely not. But he was overall, it was love to your enemies. And the disciples and a lot of the people around couldn't bear that. They was like, nah, we've got to, you know. Maybe they thought Jesus was secretly, at the last minute, just going to say, right, now's the time to get the swords out. And you can imagine him over the table when he said, whoever, he said, if you, if you haven't got a sword, sell your coat and buy one. They must have been like, right, this is it. I knew, I knew this, the truth was going to come out, Jesus. And so what happens when Jesus gets arrested? They grab, they grab hold of him. Peter's like, well, he ain't said the word yet, but this has got to be the time. Whack, takes the arrow off. Jesus said, put your sword away. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. In other words, Peter, like, I'm not... You can't spread Christianity by violence. And if you do, you will die under the government. They'll put you to death for that. That's not my way. And in fact, when you think about it, Jesus said, sell your, uh, sell your cloak and buy a sword because it is written he will be numbered among the transgressors. Why did he tell him to take the sword? He knew he was going to chop his ear off. Why did he do it? I think because he's showing... I'm fulfilling this prophecy. I'm paying for your sins. I'm innocent, Lamb of God, who's going to die in your place. So if anyone says in the future, oh, Jesus was dying for his own, uh, uh, he was a, a violent person, actually, you can point to this and say, no, he wasn't. So Jesus, I believe, purposely told him to take the sword, knew what was going to happen, said, stop. So it would be evident that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In, in Matthew 27, 46 to 49, on the cross, Jesus said, Eli, or it sounds like this on the telly, Lahi, Lahi, Lama Salafanai, or something like that. I've butchered, I've butchered it, but it's on the Passion of the Christ. So I just, uh, but it, when he said, it, he was on the cross, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In, in the words that probably Aramaic, um, it sounds like he was calling Elijah. Even on the cross, he told them, I'm going to die three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. Even on the cross, they um, still was probably thinking, oh, he's going to kick off. They said, look, quick, hold on, give him, give him some water, give him a sponge. Let's see if Elijah's going to come and take him down. They still had in their mind, even the poor Jesus hanging on the cross in agony. Oh, Elijah's going to rip him down and we're going to rip him with the nails. And it was just, they still misunderstood him. And no, Elijah didn't come and take him down from the cross. He died, gave up his breath. But amazing stuff happened. The temple in the curtain that separated us from the relationship with God was ripped in half. Amazing. Amazing. Nearly done. Nearly done. 
So that's um, how, how God raises you up in, in the valley of despair, unanswered prayer, sin, he can raise you up. And then, but every, thank you, thank you brother, um, every mountain and hill made low, the rough ground shall become level, the rugged places plain. Um, no more striving trying to get to God. There's nothing that you can do to climb your way up to heaven, that's done. And the hard strike, in, in, um, you, you can read it yourself, but in Acts chapter 15 in the Council of Jerusalem, loads of Gentiles started to come to the faith. And there was a, a, a bit of a, a, a meeting. And the conclusion of the meeting was James, one of the, um, the apostles of Jesus, Jesus' brother, he said, look, thinking about all the law, the Ten Commandments, the whole Bible, every law, they're like, do you know what? We've never been able to bear that. Like, you should never look at that and be like, oh, look at all these laws. Oh, I'm so great, I obey these. Actually, to look at those laws, you look at them and are like, oh, I'm so far away from God, I need his mercy. Yeah, and it, when the Gentiles, the non-Jews are coming to faith, he's like, James is like, it's in my, my, I advise, we don't put all these laws on the Gentiles. We haven't been able to bear it. It's a hard slog. And, and the reason, and, and all they did, they said that, the, the, the four things for the Gentiles, non-Jews to do, was don't eat food offered to idols, like sacrifice to demons or whatever, like around demon worship. Um, don't eat meat that is from strangled animals or like with blood in it, like meaning don't kill it alive. And stay away from sexual immorality. Like those four things are, are binding on the Gentile um, believers, right? And the reason they did that is because they're just like, you know, Jesus dying in our place. He's the one who done the hard service of obeying every single commandment. He fulfilled it and he gives us, his, he attributes his goodness um, and mercy. We're judged on what Christ has done. The hard service is over. No more mountain climbing to try and get right with God. God helps us to get right with himself, which is amazing. Um, and it's always been like that. Abraham, Moses, Samson, in Hebrews chapter, I think it's he Hebrews chapter 11, in the hall of faith, where all the people of, of real faith were, um, they're, they're boosted up saying, oh, these men did great things for God, blah, blah, blah. All of them have fallen in, in many ways. Um, Jephthah is one who, who is mentioned. Samson is mentioned, is, is in the hall of faith. He says about his life, he was getting on with God's business. And then one day, he says he went into a prostitute and went with a prostitute. Can you imagine that today? It's just randomly in the Bible. Oh, you know, Samson's going around doing the Lord's work. Oh, I'm just going to jump into a prostitute. Like, it's not that God, God likes this or God is for this, but it simply shows you that they're broken men who, who need salvation. Abraham lied, got his wife to lie and say, oh, you're not really my wife. Just go and have sex with that man so he won't kill me. I love Abraham. He's a man of faith and he's a man that we really need to look to. But he had flaws. As did Jephthah. Jephthah is another man who, in a war, he got, uh, was filled with the Spirit, done great, amazing stuff in this war. And he said, I know what I'll do. If I win this war... I'm going to burn my daughter alive to offer my daughter as a sacrifice to, to, to God. Wow. And these are men in the hall of faith. The, 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 the mighty men of faith who had great faith who are our examples, they, they realise their brokenness. And the mountains are going to be made level by what Jesus has done. We can't get to them. We all need grace. Anyway... And the rough and rugged places, the rough ground shall become level, the rugged places plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So, you might be someone who's on a rough and rugged path today. You might be purposely on a path of destruction you don't need to be. I was on a path of destruction because I didn't believe in God. 
Jesus can encounter you with the Holy Spirit today and put you on the right path. You have a reason to go straight because of what Jesus Christ has done. You are loved. And if you're, some of us might be on a path to destruction because we just can't, we can't help it. Sometimes we make the wrong choices because we're gratifying the desires of the flesh. We might be hanging around with the wrong people, getting involved with, you know, like relationships in and out with this woman and that woman in and out all the time or vice versa. Because we can't, we just simply can't help it because like I said, we're gratifying the desires of the flesh. We know we're on a path to destruction and who's been there time and time again, we do things over and over again that are harmful to us but they, they satisfy us. So we're just on that path of destruction. The good news is, the Holy Spirit can encounter you today and empower you to get off of that, that path, that lifestyle. And you can today be on a plain, straight path towards God. And no matter what you're going through, what Jesus has done on the cross, the glory of the Lord has been so evidently revealed to mankind. It's so obvious there's a God who loves humanity. Now, he didn't pl promise us to have an easy, plain sailing life. But you can access his grace, his mercy and his goodness. And you can know where you're going even when times are hard. Jesus got into a boat, made his disciples to get into a boat and they went through a storm. They were so frightened they thought they were going to die. But you know what? They was in the right place because they were going where God called them to go. You can know who you are and whom you belong to today. So at the end of the service, I really want to encourage each and every one of you today, thinking about that, we're ambassadors and soldiers of Christ, being raised up from the, from the valleys. What is God calling you to? Maybe some of us have been a bit comfortable and ignoring the call of God, but I want to encourage you after the service, come and get prayer and be encouraged to step out in what God's got for you next. Amen.